Good, good morning, local government. Um, uh, my name is Matt Skinner. Uh, thanks for the introduction, uh, John. And the first thing I wanted to say is, uh, is sorry because uh, Don Campbell, my boss uh, and director of Future Job, couldn't be here uh, today. But from my perspective, I think you've got the better looking version. Just, just don't tell them. Uh, so yeah, so I'm the Innovation Program Manager at FutureGov, um, and basically that means that I kind of head up all of our consultancy work, uh, and uh, I work on a bunch of products at FutureGov, including the Casserole Club, which I'll speak a little bit about later, um, and generally get to come to events like this uh, in faraway lands, uh, so it's great to be here. Uh, a little bit about my background, uh, I've worked uh, in senior change management roles in local government, uh, I'm really a bit of a geek about local government uh, in the UK, uh, and I'm passionate about open data and transparency in government, uh, and I really believe that those two things, plus quite a bit else, I guess, uh, can reduce costs uh, and improve efficiency in local government. So who are FutureGov? Uh, uh, well, this is what we do. Uh, we try to uh, work with local public services, Making better uh, and cheap, and making them better and cheaper through elegantly designed uh, digital uh, products and services. Uh, and how do we do that? Uh, well, we employ some fantastic people. Uh, we employ a range of designers, developers, uh, and people like me, uh, those geeky people uh, that love local government uh, and have a background in change management and experience. And we plug them all together in, a, in an enormous Venn diagram uh, around projects and products, bringing those skills together to help build technology with people uh, and government. And I guess underpinning all of the work that we do is a, is a design ethos. Uh, and this slide just kind of sums up uh, what we call our, uh, our 4D process, uh, with an I at the end, uh, to building products and projects uh, with local government. Uh, and that's discovery, so a rapid and intense period of research around a problem or a challenge, uh, bringing designers and creative people and working with local government to design uh, elegant solutions to those problems um, and then hopefully developing and delivering them quickly and constantly iterating, that's what that I is about, working and, and getting feedback and, and improving. Sorry, I've got three devices here that I'm using to change slides. So. <coughs> okay, um, we believe that government is fundamentally changing uh, and we think we are at the start of a revolution uh, in government where cheaper digital technology and service design are leading to more collaborative and citizen-driven uh, government, which is driving in efficiency uh, and helping government save money. And yesterday, uh, if you were here, you'd have heard a little bit about the cloud, um, which is a magical place where data is stored, seems to drift from continents to continents. Uh, but essentially, uh, I think it's really transforming the way that government is thinking about technology. Uh, gone are the days of uh, having to install clunky bits of software and being locked into expensive IT systems, uh, the cloud is enabling us to take the software within our mobile devices, basically from any device, and, ex and access them uh, quickly and cheaply. I think uh, we're seeing a change in government, as I said, and I think it's about being more honest, about being open. Uh, it's about human government design with people rather than for them, and that's really the future. And what this is really about is it's about moving from e-government, uh, which is just putting information online in PDFs, which government has been very good at, uh, to now we-government, which is seeing citizens uh, not as just people that are receiving services, but as equal partners in delivering and designing them too. So this is about a shift from public institutions to focusing on public value, and I think a shift from command and control power relationships to focus on creating uh, those relationships with people. Now at FutureGov, we're passionate about designing uh, user-centered digital technology uh, with local government and councils. Uh, governments are designing a, a new world uh, with far less money. Um, and I've been watching your budgetary uh, announcements of interest. Uh, we believe that design uh, is now needed more than ever to help us to rethink the old and be inspired by the new. And that the future of public services needs to be built on values of openness, collaboration, and that government needs to lead uh, with a design-led strategy to help solve the biggest problems. Underpinning this is that people deserve the best from public services, important human services when people need them the most. Government needs to relate problems back to the needs of people that use those services, and I think it's about raising expectations of building public services that are the envy of Silicon Valley. So I said that we need to use design to bring about 
the best of bureaucracy and to make the most of the modern. And I think it's a really tricky balance, uh, and it's one that we're uh, working at hard in the UK. Governments have got to protect uh, those institutions of democracy, uh, which are really important and under, underpin uh, the best of democracy. But at the same time, they've got to create a physical space and an online presence so that people can really help uh, to rethink solutions to challenges and problems that are faced by government today. They need to support and work with new organisations uh, like us, born digital and born open, but also to provide the safe space to design and build the future. I think fundamentally the world is full of good ideas, uh, but delivery uh, it really is everything. Um, and we know that uh, innovation uh, is about the act of doing and it's turning a bright idea uh, into a momentum and meaningful change. And it's not just, therefore, about being the most well read on others being innovative. Um, and design uh, brings with it the ability to ask the right questions and attention to detail uh, in defining the right problems. And I guess redesigning public services has to mean focusing on user needs uh, and really asking the right questions about those challenges before thinking and designing solutions. It's really about if you could change just one thing, and I think this is what we, we do in all of our products, uh, and when we're approaching challenges and problems, what one thing would make the big difference? It's about thinking small and building big. Uh, and so this, uh, this document has just been published in the UK by the Design Council, and I recommend that you have a read about that. It's full of strategies about how to do design in, in government. So government needs to create social spaces for action. We've been setting up innovation spaces uh, in the UK, uh, these are physical spaces within council town halls where people from different teams uh, and different agencies across the public sector can get together to rethink uh, how government might tackle the biggest problems uh, that are costing councils the most money. Uh, we've created online spaces as well, uh, spaces like you can look up the Shift Surrey dashboard, uh, where the councils that are involved in these innovation spaces are publishing open data and being really transparent about the work that they're doing, demonstrating in real time the impact <coughs> that they're having on services and uh, and savings. Uh, and this is broadly, uh, this diagram really uh, kind of shows you how, how we operate these innovation spaces. We bring in designers and developers and people uh, living within the community uh, who have got great ideas about how public services should be delivered uh, and we get them to work with professionals uh, to radically rethink uh, these problems in different ways and using new technologies. Uh, and we've got a design approach again that we, uh, that we implement uh, in our labs, um, we basically, uh, yeah, it's up on the screen. Um, it always starts with an intensive research uh, process to really understand those problems that we're working with, uh, then a design-based uh, approach to think up possible solutions, uh, and then we build uh, rapidly uh, a minimum viable product um, that helps to fix that problem uh, and scale it with continuous uh, feedback and improvement. It's about, I guess, failing quickly, uh, succeeding, uh, and building iteratively as we go. I just wanted to mention uh, this as well. This is uh, the Public Service Launchpad in the UK, which you uh, might have heard about. It's a program um, that is supercharging open innovation in public services and was funded uh, by central government. Uh, basically, uh, we, worked, uh, uh, we worked with this program and took uh, 35 public sector workers uh, through a innovation, um, uh, kind of social innovation program over a 14 week period, uh, an accelerated program, trained them up, supported them with mentors, uh, and coached them, uh, gave them skills about how to develop their idea and brought in a bunch of experts. Uh, and two or three of those ideas uh, will be getting investment. Um, and hopefully, well, we know that this is already happening, that these people are now going back into local government and sharing those skills uh, and transforming the sector. Uh, and just to say, watch this space, uh, because we're plotting uh, some innovation spaces potentially in the new year here in Australia. Uh, so you might have also heard about crowdfunding. Uh, I think this is a really uh, exciting model uh, and one that's growing in the UK and particularly in America at the moment and I think it has a huge potential to save councils money. Uh, you've probably heard of something called Kickstarter and if not I'd recommend you, uh, you check it out. Uh, it's, a, it's a platform online for people who can uh, choose to invest in products or, or uh, well, many products or projects that they feel really interesting. Um, and there's now uh, some kind of social, uh, social Kickstarter models uh, arising, including Citizen Investor and Spacehive, which are allowing people to invest in community projects uh, that would otherwise have been funded by local government. Uh, so it's really about communities investing in that kind of civic projects and infrastructure where government can't afford to. 
So more of where this stuff is happening. So you guys have probably heard a little bit about the government digital service, so I won't talk about it uh, for too much. But I think that the government digital service and the civil service are really leading the way in digital transformation uh, across the world. Um, they're applying a people-centered design process, uh, open standards, sharing knowledge uh, as they go to rebuild the way that people access information about public services and undertake transactions online. Uh, they're making tr online transactions more simple, quick and beautiful, uh, in my eyes, uh, and they're driving efficiency and saving costs for government. Um, they're also doing a, a lot of work around uh, how government procures, um, including if you haven't had a look at the G Cloud, uh, developing a framework list of approved suppliers for uh, technology projects and other projects in uh, government, which is saving a lot of money. And essentially what they're doing is they're turning this ugly looking beast, uh, my favourite page on this website, uh, DirectGov, used to be the one about how to build and light a barbecue, uh, <laughs> into something that is far simpler, clearer, uh, and uh, really helps you to access the information and transactions that you need to quickly online. I also think that government needs to connect community resources better um, and make the space for people to connect and help themselves, which will ultimately save money. I, at FutureGov, used to run uh, a product called the Casserole Club, uh, and I've still got a foot in the door uh, of that. Um, and basically, the Casserole Club uh, is uh, disrupting the Mills and Wheels service in the UK. Uh, it's an idea that we had um, with Surrey County Council, a big rural council in the UK, uh, who had to save millions of pounds in their adult social care budget. We did a whole bunch of research around Mills and Wills services and the cost of that in the UK is around about 88 million. Uh, and a lot of research from people that were receiving Mills and Wills services, uh, all the people telling us that they used to get a mill dropped off at the door, stuck in their freezer and probably uh, it would never see the light of day again. Um, and they had no real interaction with the people dropping off that mill. Um, so Casserole, uh, we ran a series of hack events with uh, local residents, with social innovators, designers within the council space, came up with a whole bunch of ideas uh, and settled on uh, this one, uh, Casserole Club being the, being the best. Really, it's a simple idea, it's about connecting people up with extra portions of food uh, to older isolated people in the community uh, who could really benefit from an extra hot meal every once in a while. It's reducing costs by encouraging people to help themselves and their communities better. This is a quick side on how that, how that works. Uh, I guess the biggest thing that I've learned whilst doing Casserole Club in the UK is that uh, ultimately it's a human service and the engagement is really, really powerful. Uh, we did a whole bunch of engagement work, everything from kind of making muffins and dropping them on people's doorsteps to get people to sign up as cooks, uh, to going and running community cook events in the local community. Uh, and actually what we've done is kind of created Casserole as a product which is owned very locally by councils uh, and is run very differently uh, because of that, uh, so it really feels like a local project. We've got over 4,000 cooks signed up in the UK and they've delivered over 1,000 meals uh, since, uh, since the end of last year. Uh, it's really about helping uh, older people to get online uh, and reducing social isolation and preventing malnutrition amongst older people purely by connecting people in their community. Uh, and casserole is coming to Australia. Look out for a pilot at the end of this year. So I wanted to talk about a couple of other things that are happening uh, very quickly. Um, Code for America, if you haven't heard about it, is a really exciting thing that's been happening in, uh, in America. Uh, the company uh, brings together developers, uh, designers, uh, and they, they kind of stick them in town halls in local government, helping them to, save, uh, to solve age-old problems uh, and create civic apps. Um, but really importantly, what they do is that those apps are built along open standards. Uh, that means that those technologies can then be used elsewhere. Uh, and an example of this uh, is the uh, adopt, a, um, adopt a Hydrant Civic app uh, that was created in the States. Basically, fire, the fire service um, were having real difficulties in the deep snow uh, of uh, getting to fire hydrants. Uh, and so, a uh, clever developer uh, designed uh, a very simple kind of gamified way of uh, encouraging people to dig out fire hydrants from the snow. Um, uh, and they could win points uh, and uh, like adopt these uh, adopt these hydrants on a map, um, which encourages other people to take part. And and that app is now being used uh, as it's open by Hawaii uh, to adopt tsunami sirens whose batteries kept getting stolen, for example. Uh, and now you've got one of these too. Uh, I think it's just about to start up Code for Australia. So what this is all about for me is it's about seeing this government as a platform uh, for connecting people. Uh, it's far cheaper and more efficient to look out for each other 
uh, in our local areas than it is for government to. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about one of the, uh, one of the apps uh, that we've recently been building with Lewis Council. Uh, this was uh, born out of um, some research that we did into people who are struggling financially. Uh, often there's vast amounts of support and information out there around these kind of, uh, around these kind of problems, but that it's all quite disparate and in very different and difficult locations to reach. Uh, both difficult to navigate for people uh, and often for uh, professionals as well. Uh, and Scout uh, is a tool that really helps pr practitioners to navigate through vast amounts of services uh, and support out there quickly to, to point that information to clients that are struggling with their finances and to connect them up. Um, basically what we found is that content is key. Uh, you can save information in Scout, you can send it via text, you can email it, save it for later. And what we're looking to do is to build in a kind of TripAdvisor rating uh, type system so that people can recommend services to friends in the community as well. Uh, and we've been using Scout to work with her parents of children uh, with special educational needs um, to help them connect with other parents uh, uh, in similar situations so that they can share, share information about services better um, and direct people to community resources and help them to help themselves too. Um, we found across public services that so much of practitioner uh, time is often wasted uh, on administration uh, and collaboration and technology has to mean creating more network public frontline services which will help to save the government money. Uh, Kirsty, yesterday if you were here talked a little bit about Patchwork, uh, another one of our apps uh, which is currently live in Australia uh, in Victoria uh, and New South Wales. Um, so I won't talk too much about this but really this uh, app um, was born out of a problem uh, around agencies not being able to share information uh, with each other or see uh, who was working uh, with who around, uh, around their clients. Uh, there's often huge case management systems which are clunky, uh, ineffective and often quite complex and unconnected. There's a lot of uh, objectives used in that sentence. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but Patchwork really helps to visualise what is already happening informally in a really simple way. It's almost a, a kind of supercharged framework uh, that puts the client at the centre. Uh, it's a secure web application that allows practitioners from a range of agencies to share, uh, share details and ultimately just to connect with each other around a client or family to, uh, to share information. It's hosted securely on the web uh, and it's in the cloud uh, and there's no complicated installation process. Uh, at all. You can log into it from PC uh, or from any device. Um, and so ultimately I guess uh, Patchwork is about connecting people to have the conversations that they need to. Uh, it's human technology and it really gets better as more agencies join and more people connect. And this is what it looks like. As I said we're really excited uh, that we're on Patchwork out in Australia. It's live across uh, 20 councils in and around Melbourne and Victoria. Uh, covering over 280 clients, uh, has 400 practitioners and 143 agencies involved. Um, and it's the only system uh, we believe that everyone can be on. Uh, agencies from a two-man NGO uh, right up to big state departments. Um, so, how do we bridge the community and local government resources gap? I just want to kind of end on another product that we've recently been working on uh, called Lantern um, and this is a product that we've been working on uh, with Surrey County Council and Sefton Council in the UK. Uh, it's a new future gov product that's helping people to understand their social care needs uh, and direct them to support within the community that can help them before they hit statutory services. Uh, and really uh, this work has been born out of uh, the fact that uh, there's a growing older population in the UK uh, and we know uh, from the research that we've done that finding uh, support about social services is incredibly complex uh, and often very expensive. Uh, and our research would suggest that around 80% of practitioner time uh, is spent on administration in trying to identify uh, that need uh, and support. <coughs> so what we've done uh, is we've worked uh, to look at what is currently a paper-based uh, process uh, of, uh, of identifying uh, social care need. And we've turned that into a fairly, I hope you'll agree, beautiful looking form. Uh, but most importantly about this form uh, is that it produces tailored information as the user completes it. Uh, and by that I mean that it pushes information at the user about services that are both within their community that could help them, uh, as well as those statutory services uh, that they uh, might need as their need gets more, uh, more, more complex and severe. 
And I think what this is about uh, is really bridging that gap between what I was talking about earlier, uh, that e-government, putting information online, and pushing it towards we government. So it's about how we can connect people up within their communities uh, to help themselves more. And I think the great thing about uh, this as well is that you can invite practitioners in as you're kind of completing your form and get their expert advice too. Um, and you can really manage the expectations uh, from the service as you go. Okay, I just wanted to end on this slide. Uh, I've probably gone over time, so I'm sorry, John. Um, government is really what we do together that we can't do alone. Uh, I think that sums up, hopefully, what I've talked about uh, this morning. Um, yeah, thanks very much. That's a good point. Uh, I think it's, I mean, I don't, I don't think that casserole uh, could ever really replace meals and meal services entirely. I think it's about a mixed model. Uh, I think that there are some people who, uh, in the UK, uh, that are using casserole services, that are using it as a substitute, like for a couple of meals a week. Um, but those that are most vulnerable, I think, will always need a level of statutory support. But I think it's about thinking about uh, ways that the community can really help to uh, support people who are potentially falling into those more severe categories at an earlier stage. Uh, and I think what I describe Casserole in particular as doing is helping uh, those people who are almost like latent meals and meals services demand. Um, but yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't think it's, I don't think there's a model that says it's all about community support. I think there has to be a mixed model to this stuff. Um, but I think that it's, it's worth exploring the capacity of the community to help. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're currently... <laughs> Good question, John, thanks. Uh, Part of the reason that I've been out here this week is to explore, um, so we've been, uh, like Kirsty at the back there can give you a wave, she can talk to you about patchwork a little bit more detail, but we're kind of hoping to expand uh, patchwork across, uh, across Victoria uh, and hopefully grow it throughout Australia, but we're also at the moment looking at ways of setting up uh, Future Gov Australia and having kind of a permanent base here. Uh, we're talking uh, about some of that innovation uh, services stuff I mentioned around, uh, around the labs work, uh, we'd love to get that love to get that going here uh, and as I mentioned earlier as well we're talking about a casserole pilot uh, in Victoria probably at the start of uh, the start of next year so uh, hopefully lots of work in Australia for future government.